Hi everyone, and thank you for tuning in to the Partners of Scott County Watersheds Forum for September. My name is Cassie Drool, and I'm the coordinator for Partners of Scott County Watersheds. And before we get started with Joel's presentation today, I wanted to share what Partners of Scott County Watersheds is all about. Our mission is to improve the stewardship of Scott County Watersheds through education, technical guidance, and volunteer opportunities. The education portion includes the monthly forums like the one you're going to see today. Uh, we also offer technical guidance to anyone who's interested in making water quality improvement projects possible at their home or business. And then also we offer volunteer opportunities through our uh, cleanup events as well as our snapshot volunteer water quality monitoring events. You can visit our website, partnersofscottcountywatersheds.org, to learn more about all of those. We also have a Facebook page and a LinkedIn page. And if you're interested in getting on our email uh, regular listserv, you can email me, um, info at partnersofscottcountywatersheds.org, or you can go to the Support Us button on our website. We do offer a membership and funding partner program. The funds that we receive go towards continuing our snapshot events. We restock our water quality monitoring materials, and we also are able to continue our special workshops and our forums. The next forum will be Tuesday, October 20th um, from 12 to 1. It will most likely be in the Zoom format again, so you can stay tuned for more details on that as the date gets closer. And then our next snapshot is Tuesday, October 6th from 8 to 12 in Bettendorf. And you can go to the Extreme Cleanup webpage in order to register for that. So with that, I will let Joel go ahead and start his presentation. And thank you so much, Joel, for being our speaker this month. Pleasure. Uh, I want to uh, welcome everybody, of course, to the to our talk today. Uh, and of course, those that don't know me, my name is Joel Vanderbush. I'm the curator of conservation and education here at Niobe Zoo. Uh, and one of the great opportunities that we have is to work with a number of conservation partners. Uh, and uh, today's uh, a lot of the content of today's talk uh, is from deep discussions with one of those conservation partners. Uh, so I'm going to go ahead and get uh, started here, and you'll be able to see who I'm talking about. Uh, so this is actually um, with our partner, uh, Cho Ahawil. Uh, that actually means Blue Kingdom in the Mayan language. Uh, and so that these partners uh, are down in Mexico, uh, which is where uh, they do a lot of uh, research with the whale sharks down there. Uh, but today, of course, uh, we're going to talk more than just whale sharks. We're going to talk about uh, whale sharks and algae, and of course, you uh, and the impact our river pollution has on uh, all oceans. Uh, so we want to really start talking about algae. Right. Let, let's start with start with the small stuff. Um, there are three major types of algae, uh, and so that would be like your cyanobacteria, which is your blue green algae, uh, which we see a lot of. That's your AKA pond scum. Uh, you've got your microalgae, uh, which are you know can be pretty complex, uh, and then of course uh, there are things like kelp and seaweed. Uh, so with uh, macroalgae, you know these can of course grow into these uh, huge forests. Um, so that, uh, you know, lots of different animals uh, live there. And it's, it's, that's pretty amazing. We'll talk more about that a little bit later on. Uh, but let's talk a little bit more about uh, our things like our phytoplankton. Uh, this is the blue-green and the microalgae, And this is, of course, incredibly important because it produces 50 to 80 percent of all of the Earth's oxygen. Um, but the challenge with that is that, uh, you know, a little bit can... Uh, be a little too much, you know, too much of a good thing, uh, which is, of course, algal blooms. And so even the CDC puts warnings out about our algal blooms. It says, if it's green, don't go in. Discolored water could be a sign of harmful, uh, harmful algal bloom, which can harm people, animals, and the environment. And I mean, it's, it's such a simple little mes message, but it is uh, so true. Uh, so when we think about algal blooms, this is actually where I grew up. And so if you follow my little uh, arrow down here, this, this area down here is just outside of Monroe, Michigan, uh, where I grew up. There's a place called Bulls Harbor where we'd go to uh, Lake, Lake Erie all the time. Uh, but of course, just kind of giving you an idea, here's Detroit. This is Windsor, not to be confused. This isn't Detroit. 
that's Canada. This is Detroit up here. Uh, Toledo is down here. Uh, Sandusky, Ohio, the home to Cedar Point. Uh, and then Cleveland is over here. Um, but you can see just from, you know, a space shot that that's a pretty huge algal bloom um, taking, you know, a productive uh, freshwater lake and uh, making it a lot less productive uh, after these algal blooms. Um, now, of course, we're probably more familiar with uh, the algal blooms that happen down at the Mississippi River Delta. Uh, so this, of course, the little boot of Louisiana. Uh, as the Mississippi empties into the Gulf of Mexico, you can see the huge algal bloom here. Uh, and you know, when we think about that, um, it isn't just the Mississippi River. Sure, we live on the Mississippi River. We, we know that it's a pretty powerful river, but that's not the major issue down uh, in the Gulf, it's because the Mississippi is, is only the emptying point, you know. Um, it's a 2,350 mile journey uh, to the south, but 41% of the United States actually drains into the Mississippi River, and of course what we know as the Mississippi River Basin, uh, which you can see highlighted on your screen here. You know, so when each year you got about 1.7 million tons of these nutrients, um, nitrogen, phosphorus, and things like that, coming from farms and cities, all of these, of course, are going to empty into the Gulf of Mexico. Um, and of course, it creates algal blooms. And so, you know, when we think about where do these algal blooms come from, we know that it's coming a lot from, you know, right here in the breadbasket of America with our agricultural runoff, uh, residential and urban runoff, as well as wastewater. Um, so when we think about these things, you know, what is it that's getting in there? Of course, there's things like animal manure and, and the wastewater that comes from uh, some of those um, different farms, but of course your chemical fertilizers that are being put on uh, fields such as nitrates and phosphorus. You know, your wastewater, uh, a lot of uh, our towns are, are pretty old and um, so they don't always have separate stormwater and wastewater. And so if it is still tied together and if we get some pretty torrential rains like we just had over this last week, um, that of course can back up your stormwater drains, which can also back up your sewer drains. Um, now, of course, uh, for those cities that have those separated, that's fine, but you still run into uh, some challenges with sewage overflow, uh, which can of course impact the river. Now, when we look at residential and urban runoff, yes, we're looking at those same chemical fertilizers, but it's mostly from our lawns. Um, and that's, that's a whole discussion for another day on uh, you know, how people are addicted to their lawns. Um, but certainly the fertilizers that we put on it, again, those nitrates and, and phosphorus that we put in there uh, creates these algal blooms. But of course you get a lot of stormwater discharge, which adds a lot of other pollutants to that water, including your plastics, oil, gas, heavy metal pollutants, all those different things that can get washed off the land and washed directly into our great river heading south. Um, all of those have a pretty significant impact on the pollution in our oceans. Um, now, of course, when we're talking specifically about algal blooms, uh, this leads to eutrophication. Uh, and this is when the excessive amounts of algae that grow from all these extra nutrients can actually block the sun from reaching a lot of aquatic plants. This, of course, prevents photosynthesis and results in plant death. Uh, now, of course, when the, all, that massive amount of algae dies off and it sinks down to the bottom, it actually um, reduces all the oxygen uh, in that water, making it hypoxic. And of course, fish and mollusks, they can't survive off, you know, no oxygen in the water. And this results in a mass die off of organisms. So when you look at this little diagram here, it's all cute and stuff. You know, on the left side, no eutrophication, which you've got plenty of organisms that are down there. Um, but on the right side, um, where there is eutrophication, um, you see that there's jellies there. Now I can tell you as a scuba diver, I've encountered this uh, quite a lot, uh, diving uh, not long after um, things like, you know, when uh, the hypoxic zone is affected down there or after an algal bloom, you've got a huge increase actually of sea jellies because they are eating the algae. So it, it allows them uh, to, to really uh, reproduce quite quickly and um, trying to dive through thousands and thousands of jellies to get below them to do the work I'm trying to do can be very challenging. Uh, but when we look at, you know, that local impact um, from all of these different areas, you know, you get this regular annual die-off of organisms and this, of course, uh, we know as a dead zone. Um, now, you may be familiar with the dead zone that we have down in the Gulf of Mexico, but you may not be familiar with the fact that we have over 400 major dead zones on Earth, covering tens of thousands of square miles. And of course, this is affected by all the major rivers in the world, from the Amazon, the Nile, Yangtze River, all of these. And of course, when we think about the Gulf of Mexico, um, you know, on average, just kind of this long-term average, um, 
of the Gulf of Mexico dead zone is 5,387 miles, square miles. Um, just in 2017, it grew to a record 8,776 square miles. Uh, this year, they projected it was going to be quite large. Uh, but interestingly enough, Hurricane Hannah came in and distributed uh, a lot of that before the algal bloom really exploded. Um, so, you know, usually we say hurricanes are bad. In this situation, it broke up the water enough that the algal bloom didn't happen and the eutrophication didn't happen. So our dead zone is actually only a couple of thousand square miles uh, instead of nearly 9,000. So interest, interesting. Uh, now let's talk about what eutrophication does on our marine communities. You know, the first one, of course, we have to think of is estuaries because it's right where the rivers enter the ocean. You know, and these areas are vital nesting, breeding, and feeding habitats for broad diversity of species. Um, but of course, when all that excess algae uh, comes in, uh, and then, you know, the plants die off, and then, you know, the algae dies off, uh, all of this prematurely decomposes, which of course releases a, a large amounts of carbon dioxide into the water, which when you have an increased amount of carbon dioxide that uh, intensifies ocean acidification, and that slows the growth of fish. It can also prevent shell formation and bivalve mollusks, which is problematic because they're also great filter feeders that help keep our waters clean. But if they can't grow correctly, then, you know, that's another filter feeder that's, you know, out of the scenario. Um, let's talk also about coral reefs because many reefs are just off the coasts of uh, areas where rivers are uh, emptying into the ocean. Uh, and of course, the algal growth that happens on the surface also can happen um, on the coral reefs themselves, which can crowd out the corals themselves and they can't establish you know, or expand their colonies um, if it's covered in algae. Uh, plus deposited sediment is another huge issue. Um, when you've got discharge coming from rivers, it isn't just carrying nutrients, you know, from all the tillage and everything like that that's happening on farms, you know, you get a lot of sediment uh, in the rivers as well. Uh, when this comes out of the rivers, it is smothering corals uh, and it interferes certainly with their ability to feed and reproduce. And then of course, the river discharge also has pesticides in it, uh, which interferes with their reproduction, their growth. Uh, and if there are sewage discharge, of course, that can introduce pathogens into our reef system. Uh, and that's why that sea turtle is looking at you all judgingly. I'm just saying. Now, of course, we have to also remember that uh, coral reefs, they don't make up a whole lot of the ocean, 0.2% uh, of the ocean to be specific, but they house 25% of all ocean species. They depend on the reefs for breeding and growth and survival. And so even though it's such a small geographic area, you know, it's incredibly important to the species that live in the ocean. Uh, now, of course, acidification is happening there too, which dissolves the reef's uh, actual surface because you got to remember, you know, that um, calcium bicarbonate, which is like, you know, we also know is like limestone, but calcium bicarbonate can actually be uh, dissolved uh, with acid. And so that's actually happening to the surface of a lot of the reefs. And when uh, corals reproduce, they release little tiny polyps uh, that float through the water and they establish uh, on, you know, pieces of the reef and then they grow on there. But if they can't establish there because the surface keeps dissolving, uh, then of course your uh, coral can't reproduce. Now on top of that, we all know that uh, ocean temperatures are also increasing due to climate change, uh, which has resulted in 75% of all the reefs in the world are currently being bleached, um, which is uh, kind of that last step before death, uh, which we, it's confirmed that there's 50% of dead reefs on the planet. 50% of our reefs are gone, right? And so we look at this picture right here, that's the Great Barrier Reef. You know, in Australia, as a scuba diver, it is one of those things that's on my bucket list to get down there and actually still dive that reef. But I better hurry because, you know, 67% of it, two thirds of it is already gone. Uh, and so there's uh, a lot of recovery efforts that are taking place uh, for reefs. You know, there's a lot of uh, great research coming out of places like Moat Marine Lab um, and that they're trying to, you know, get coral to adapt to higher temperatures and things. And they're trying to uh, regrow a lot of the reefs and there is some success there, but you know, we, I know from working with endangered species my entire career that it is always hard when your back is against the wall rather than being able to do proactive things. And so, you know, we still need to help out reefs, um, but that again is another discussion on another day. Uh, let's talk about continental shelf communities. We often don't think about these. Uh, this of course is where uh, deep ocean water uh, have cold water currents 
and they hit up against the continental shelf, which drives these old nutrients that, you know, settle down to the bottom and drives them back to the surface. Now, of course, that nutrient upwelling then produces uh, a lot of nutrients at the surface, which supports plankton growth. It's a little different than, you know, the nutrients that we're putting in the water, uh, but this uh, is important for all the filter feeders like these manta rays uh, that depend on uh, that plankton. Now, the challenge with eutrophication is, you know, you still got these rivers that are emptying into the oceans, which go right out to the edge of the continental shelf. Uh, and eutrophication uh, can also, certainly it increases the amount of algae that's in plankton, uh, like the phytoplankton, but it, it reduces the diversity of that plankton. Let me show you what I mean. Plankton isn't just algae, right? Uh, there's phytoplankton, yes, but there's also zooplankton. Right? So sure there's algae in there, but there's dinoflagellates and protozoans and copepods and isopods and decapods and amphipods. There's so many pods, a lot more than what I put on there. But of course, krill and even fish eggs and, and all of these things are, are existing in the surface together, uh, which is why it is so nutrient rich for so many animals to feed on it. Uh, and of course, when you have large filter feeding animals like whales or whale sharks, you know, they are the largest creatures that have ever lived on this planet, yet they're eating the smallest of organisms on this planet through filter feeding. Uh, and that leads me to the whale shark. Uh, when we think about the whale shark, I mean, again, largest fish in the world, yet it is an endangered species. Uh, and that is, you know, wholly due to us. You know, it's the conditions that, that we're putting uh, the oceans through, uh, and of course our own activities from boating and you know being hit by ships and, and all of these. Uh, and there's a general lack of understanding of where whale sharks go. Uh, we don't know you know too many, too much about where they congregate or you know do they uh, migrate seasonally like a lot of whale pods do. Um, there, there's a lot of unanswered questions which has led to uh, developing research partnerships. And so one of our partners is, I mentioned earlier, Cho Ajo Wheel. Uh, and they're, of course, down in Mexico, based just outside of Cancun. Uh, and, you know, so we were able to go down last year and do a research trip with them. Uh, I was supposed to be there this past month doing it again. Uh, but of course, we all know what happened with that because Americans, nobody, no country wants Americans to travel there. Uh, and I totally get it. So I wasn't able to go on the trip this year, but um, you know, you can see that uh, you know, this, this picture is very simply, I'm just glad or glad to be bigger than plankton because uh, well, sharks are pretty big. Uh, luckily, while their mouth, you know, is uh, four to five feet wide, uh, their throat is actually only about as big as a golf ball. Um, so a lot of people say don't, don't you worry about getting swallowed by a shark or something like that. But they are filter feeding sharks. If I got stuck in their mouth, they would just kind of spit me out uh, because they can't really swallow me or do anything to me, uh, which is great. And no, I haven't actually been inside the mouth of a shark, which is good for me. <laughs> so uh, the team that went down, uh, Penny Hillier and Free Pole in this picture, they are zookeepers here at the zoo. Uh, Luke Cormack there in the blue shirt, uh, he actually uh, is one of the top uh, underwater photographers in the world. He works for folks like National Geographic and Discovery Channel. And, you know, a lot of his work has been featured in award-winning cinematography, which is pretty outstanding. Uh, and, you know, we put this investigation and research flag up on the boat, uh, which allows us to go out amongst the whale sharks uh, and get in with the whale sharks, um, because there are still things like tour boats that come uh, through the area, and, and they all have to make sure that they have, uh, you know, things like life vests on, and they have limited amounts of time that they can be in the water, uh, whereas we can spend a lot more time in the water um, under our research flag. So, of course, it's uh, heading out to sea, and uh, getting all geared up, uh, there's Luke with his big, giant, awesome, amazing underwater camera. Uh, and uh, there's Penny there. And of course, our fearless captain, that's Rafael De La Parra. Uh, he is the marine biologist there for Choahu Wheel. And uh, sometimes he uh, looks like a pirate. So he, he's not searching for other ships. Uh, he is actually searching for things like uh, filter feeding uh, whale sharks right there at the surface. Um, but, you know, they're so big, it's not really that difficult to see them. Uh, and uh, it just so happens that just off the coast of the Yucatan Peninsula, um, if you head kind of northeast of Cancun, uh, Pasilo Mujertos, um, you can find a huge aggregation of whale sharks, one of the largest aggregations in the world. Over 400 of these whale sharks congregate 
uh, in that general region uh, each and every year. And so once we actually find them, you know, it's a matter of trying to identify uh, candidates that we might want to try to attach a tag to. Um, so, you know, when there are so many whale sharks in the water, as you can see from this, uh, it's not hard to get close to them or to, to see them. I mean, you just turn around and there are whale sharks just coming toward you. And you just kind of have to be careful not to just get run into uh, by one because they're all just like filter feeding. They don't really care about you that much. Um, it's not like we can do much to them anyway um, with our little bodies. Of course, boats are a different story. Um, but uh, like I say, it's, it's pretty easy to, to locate them. Uh, and we do actually try to identify them uh, through their spot patterns. We can take pictures uh, of their side and uh, there's a huge database, a whale shark database um, international that uh, helps to identify whale sharks. So in tourist sites, tourists can actually become part of citizen science work uh, in that they can take pictures of whale sharks when they're down there and then submit them uh, to that database uh, and then we can see, you know, if particular sharks have been identified in different regions of the world um, to figure out where they're traveling to. Uh, but in lieu of doing that with photography, um, we actually also like to try and do it with actual satellite trackers. Uh, and so this little tracker, while it looks like a giant needle, that's not what it is. That's a big antenna on the top. Uh, those are actually batteries on the inside. And you can see there's four little mounting holes there and it's attack attached to a string and a float. Uh, the float is really only on there just to keep it afloat in case you were to drop it while you're trying to attach it to a whale shark because that little piece right there costs about 2000 bucks, uh, And so we don't like to drop them and lose them to the bottom of the ocean. Um, so uh, once we see the whale sharks and we have identified candidates, that's when we get all geared up. And uh, so here's Raphael. He's uh, getting geared up in his scuba gear uh, and a pneumatic drill. In fact, uh, when he was here, uh, we, we had him here in January of last year as part of our conservation science speaker series and we did a nice fundraiser for him and we got him some equipment including that drill right there. We actually got him two of those drills uh, and that's a pneumatic drill which attaches to his air tank so it can operate underwater uh, and because you do actually have to uh, drill these bolts into the fin of the shark, the, the dorsal fin. Um, so that's what you see Raphael doing right here. And that's, of course, the top side view. This is what he's actually doing underwater. Now, this is actually not quite as accurate because it's usually a two-person job. Uh, so one of the things I got to do when I was down there is hold it in place while he gets the first bolt in. Uh, so I essentially have to swim up to the shark, sort of like how Raphael is doing underwater right there. Uh, I'd be grabbing onto the shark fin and holding onto it uh, with one hand while holding the... Um, uh, the transmitter on to the shark fin while Raphael puts the first bolt in. Uh, once he gets that in, it's actually, um, he has uh, bolts that are actually filed down to where they're actually pretty pointy like a drill bit um, so that he doesn't have to drill it and then try to stick a bolt in it. He just drills the actual bolt in. Uh, a lot of people ask, you know, does that hurt the shark? Well, I can tell you that they certainly feel it, um, but that piece of cartilage is so stiff uh, and thick um, it's not highly sensitive per se, um, so they certainly feel it, but you know, do we know what level of pain they're in when that happens? I'm not sure. Uh, could it be like getting an ear piercing? It's possible, um, but I do know that they feel it because when we were doing that once, um, he started to drill through and then the shark was like, no, we're, we're not gonna do this. And you see that giant tail in that picture, he just kind of flicked it a couple of times and we went flying off and, uh, he may have grazed my leg and, you know, I got a really great scar on uh, my shin from that tail because uh, the scales of a shark are kind of like little teeth. Uh, and so it feels like sandpaper when you're touching a shark. But of course, when it rakes across your skin, it's going to leave a mark. Um, so again, once uh, Raphael gets the four bolts through, uh, then he actually has to uh, put some little nuts on it. Right, so that's what he's doing in here. He's dropped the drill. Uh, he's just holding it, and he's actually uh, putting little nuts on the four bolts uh, because that transmitter is actually going to stay on uh, for about three years. Um, so the batteries will last that long, and uh, every time that animal comes to the surface, uh, it's going to connect with uh, tracking satellites up in uh, Earth's orbit, 
and it's going to give us a ping as to where that shark uh, is in the world. Now, in this image, you see the float is still attached. Uh, the only reason that is is uh, because we still had one more bolt to put in. So until all four bolts are put in there, um, then we don't we don't cut off the float. Uh, so we knew that we still had to get back get back out and finish on this particular shark because, of course, if they decide to swim away, we just let them swim away because they are far more powerful than we are. Uh, and so we'll come, but they tend to just stay and hang out. Like they don't swim off, you know, 100 miles or anything because they're just still busy filter feeding in this area. Uh, so we can come in, take a break, go back into the water uh, and uh, continue our work. Uh, now there's also another type of tag. It's called a behavior tag. Now this particular one you notice is actually just strapped on. So there is, it's less, certainly less invasive for the shark. Uh, but this is uh, for localized research. Um, it only has about 48 hours of transmission. Uh, so once we strap it on, we have to come back in, within 48 hours, typically just after 48 hours. It's got a longer duration of research uh, because that's the interesting thing with the ecotourism. It does actually help fund the research. Um, so that is, that is pretty important. And as long as you, you know, manage that ecotourism to where it isn't bothering the sharks or anything like that, um, then it is a valuable way to, to still get people uh, to support uh, the research uh, that's going on there. Uh, now, of course, the satellite tracking itself, this is kind of the result of it. This is actually from a website that you can go on and actually track any shark uh, that we tagged. Um, so when we look down here, this is Quintana Roo, uh, just off of the Yucatan Peninsula. This general area where those stars are, that's the area where they congregate so much. And as I was mentioning before, if you look right here, this is a continental shelf. Now, it's not coming out from the ocean, but here in the Caribbean Sea, you can see these areas are too, you know, awfully deep. Um, there are these tectonic plates, that's an edge right there, but this is pretty deep, and so it still allows deep water, uh, cool, cold, cold water currents to crash up against uh, the continental shelf, which brings all of uh, those nutrients up into this general area, which is why the whale sharks keep coming back to this area every single year. One, it's generally protected from all the waves and everything like that you might get out in the main ocean. Um, uh, but so, but we don't know everything that they're doing down there. You know, are they breeding there? Are they just feeding there? Uh, we know that they come there seasonally, um, but we don't know a whole, whole lot of other things. Now we talked earlier about migration and, and do these animals you know, migrate really far? Do they stay locally? Well, it's a little bit of both. Uh, so if you look over here, there's the three names in yellow, that's Lucho, uh, the orange one is Milo, and the uh, pinkish red one there is Rio Lady. She was actually the very first uh, whale shark ever tagged. Uh, and you see she's, she's pretty local. She stays you know, within the Gulf and within the Caribbean Sea. Uh, we look at uh, Lucho, he does kind of the same thing. He pops out here a little bit and he stays, stayed within uh, the Caribbean Sea. But then and you go, okay, so maybe these sharks just kind of hang out in this area. Well, then you see a shark like Milo and he's like all the way out, you know, into the, into the Atlantic Ocean before circling back around. Um, and so we just don't know. There, there are likely regional populations for sure, um, because like this, but we, until we get more data, until we tag more sharks and actually discover, are they crossing the Atlantic? Are they going all the way over uh, past Africa? Are they going into the Indian Ocean or anything like that? Or is that a different population? You know, we don't know those things. And that's, that's the thing. Uh, that's why research is so important. Um, and we would think that after all this time, shouldn't we know more? But you got to understand, satellite tracking has only been going on uh, for less than a decade. Um, much less than a decade, uh, and trying to find effective ways to tag a shark is very important. There's another organization called OSEARCH, and they actually track great white sharks, but they actually have to bring the great white sharks up onto a boat, right? They have like a sinking platform, uh, and they, they bring the shark up, and then they raise the platform up out of the water, uh, and they do all these tests and things and put the tracker on, and then they lower it back down and send the shark back out. Well, you can't really do that with a shark that's 40 feet long. You know, that's just wow! I can't even imagine that. So, so finding you know there are others that that net sharks and stuff, the the whale sharks, uh, but that of course stresses the animal out. Uh, this is like the least invasive way and the least stressful way to interact with these sharks, get the tag on them, and and let them go amongst their merry way. Um, so, there's so a lot of great research coming out uh, on that. So, the question is, what can we learn uh, from all of this? Of course, 
We're learning where these areas of congregation are around the world when there's tracking going on, uh, figuring out what draws them to the area when we look at, you know, things like the continental shelf and we realize, you know, these nutrient upflow areas. Um, if you know that that is an area that these animals are all flocking to, can you protect that area? Right? If it's a main shipping lane, it's a lot harder to protect that zone. Uh, but if we can figure out in, you know, and say, hey, this is an internationally endangered species, um, we need to establish a protected zone uh, right here so that these animals can continue to come here every single year. Uh, but then there are other things like they feed at night. We, we don't really know. Do they only come up during the day? Uh, where do they go? Do they sink down deep like whales? Whales will dive back down deep and all these things. We don't know these things. So that's why we're trying to find out more. You know, I mentioned earlier about are they reacting to boats and human presence, whether that's through ecotourism uh, or shipping or um, you know, recreational boating, you know, any of those things, um, you know, those behavior tags can really give us insight into that. Uh, but these last two, these environmental impacts are a lot bigger. And this research has really just begun, uh, especially with microplastics, you know, trying to discover, of course, we know that whale sharks are eating microplastics because they're filter feeding across the surface. And there are so many areas with plastics. Uh, and when plastic degrades, it doesn't decompose, it just breaks down into smaller plastics. Uh, and so we know that these animals are eating this microplastics and what impact is that gonna have on them long term? Uh, and of course, eutrophication. Right, all the areas that are along the coasts that these animals are coming to, there are rivers that flow uh, into those areas. Uh, and of course, eutrophication is happening there. Wherever there is a human presence, uh, eutrophication is going to happen. Uh, you're gonna get these al algae blooms. Um, do the whale sharks care? Are they going to feast on those algae blooms or when all that algae rapidly dies and completely denudes the area and destroys all the other plankton and destroys all the other living things in there, are whale sharks going to be affected by that too? And we have to understand this isn't really just about the whale sharks, right? Whale sharks are our umbrella species. It's about all of the other area animals that live within that region. Uh, but the whale shark is just one of those um, kind of at the top of the food chain that, you know, we say, hey, we want to uh, study this, this mega vertebrate and, um, and people are much more interested in that than studying the actual I mean, we study the plankton, but we don't say, hey, look at all this plankton, because people don't get quite as excited about that as they do on whale sharks. Now, of course, we also know that it's not just a localized impact. It is a global impact. You know, this is just a, a heat view of the Earth. We know that uh, the temperatures are rising across the Earth. We know that there are these dead zones. We know that climate change is a massive issue. We know that ocean acidification is a massive issue. With all the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, uh, the ocean is the greatest carbon dioxide sink, but even it is reaching um, of a, a filling point to where uh, acid levels are going up, which means that it's, it's, it's really full of carbon. Uh, Silication, of course, from rivers, overfishing and bycatch affect every animal that's in the ocean, including whale sharks. Of course, oil spills, you know, last week's oil spill, uh, you got to <laughs> just recognize that oil is always going to be a major issue. It is nearly as safe. And of course, we're trying to find oil in much more dangerous places, like off the edge of the continental shelf. It's not easy to find oil anymore uh, because it is pretty much running out. And that's a whole nother presentation for another day. And of course, the big one, plastics. You know, the, all of the issues that, you know, you're looking at here seems like a doomsday scenario. It kind of is, I'm not gonna lie. Um, but can we do anything about it? Well, let's focus on the things that we can do, right? Can we reduce the nutrient flow and prevent algal blooms in the first place? Now, we know protecting marine resources starts with sound agricultural waste management practices uh, that we can actually do. It's just a matter of can we get the industry to go along with it? You know, can we get them to do nutrient management techniques? You know, applying the right amount of nutrients at the right time using the right method and not over nutrifying everything. Uh, using, of course, conservation drainage practices, whether that's modifi modifying existing drainage systems, uh, installing bioreactors or saturated buffers. Of course, having year-round ground cover, you know, that keeps the nutrients there. It also keeps the soil there and decreases erosion by putting in some cover crops, which, of course, we know a lot of areas are doing. Um, but field buffers are incredibly important, too. You know, when we look across the landscape and it's nothing but field, 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 when you drive across Iowa and then, God forbid, drive across Nebraska, you see nothing but fields. And the problem is with that, there are no buffers, especially, you know, when we look in Iowa and Illinois, especially the areas that are around the rivers, um, there still needs to be buffers there. 
um, that isn't just around the field, but also uh, near water sources, right? Um, so that's going to, uh, of course, restore all of the banks, uh, but it's also going to make those areas much more productive for things like our pollinators, which is another discussion for another day. Uh, so of course, managing livestock in their access to streams also will help restore those, those stream banks and importantly, engaging in watershed efforts through collaboration with organizations like uh, Scott County and, and what you guys are doing in the collaborative uh, efforts that you have made uh, with all the different organizations by bringing uh, folks in to talk about these issues is incredibly important uh, to staving off algal blooms. But then let's just talk about algae itself. Can algae actually help? You know, we talk about the algal bloom and it's so bad and we think algae must be bad, bad, bad. But you got to remember, algae is just reacting to what we put in the water. Uh, we know that algae can absorb carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and upon its death, it can sequester that carbon dioxide on the ocean floor. As we mentioned, the ocean is the greatest carbon sink in the world, but not just the water itself, it's the living things in the water. Um, scientists are actually looking at different ways that we can responsibly expand algae in, in targeted areas like uh, a number of the southern oceans don't have a high number of algae uh, in, in the oceans there. Um, so is there something that they could do to increase, again, responsibly increase the amount of algae in order to sequester more of that carbon? You know, algae stores energy as oil, uh, and scientists have been able to harvest these oils and convert them into biofuels, but not biofuels, you know, like we think of being made from corn, in which, you know, the production of the biofuel is worse than the solution, you know, of trying to reduce, um, you know, greenhouse gas emissions and stuff. This, this is a way to produce biofuel that actually does have a significant impact on slowing climate change, uh, but the algae industry isn't a huge industry right now, uh, but certainly could be. Uh, animal science, of course, uh, they look at adding kelp, you know, to uh, feeding livestock. And by doing so, it actually reduces the level of methane in their poop. Now, when we think about that, uh, you go, okay, is uh, our cow farts a bad thing? Well, you know, when you think about the 2.5 billion ruminants on earth that are emitting all of this methane, which is a greenhouse gas, you know, they're, they're putting as much of that into the atmosphere as we are from burning transportation-based fossil fuels. It is a huge impact, and uh, we have to look for alternative protein sources other than just doing what we do the way that we do it, which isn't getting us very positive results. Uh, now, if we think about seaweeds like kelp, you know, you got these kelp forests and all these things that are growing out there. You know, if you were to establish, you know, some of this, this uh, brown algae, you know, like kelp and, and things like that, uh, the seaweeds in the areas that, you know, currently are feeding these algal blooms and creating these dead zones from agricultural runoff, they could actually remediate a lot of those waters by actually absorbing the excess nutrients into the kelp rather than an algae bloom. Uh, and of course we could harvest that kelp. So I'm not saying, you know, we still need to look to ways to reduce the amount of nutrients uh, in river systems, but we could also help to do that and, you know, establish another industry. It's possible. Uh, algae is also considered a superfood. You know, it's, it's really rich in nutrients and minerals and all the essential amino acids, omega-3s, and it's a complete protein. And of course, because it's algae, it does not have a plant cell wall. A plant cell wall is so much more difficult to break down. Uh, that's why you see, you know, huge animals like elephants eat 250 pounds of plant material per day, but a ton of it also comes out of species because it's hard to break down uh, plant cell walls. One of the reasons that we eat meat is that it's an easy, easily digestible protein uh, with a cell membrane rather than a cell wall. Well, the interesting thing about algae is that it has all the benefits of plants, but it has a cell membrane more like uh, like an animal cell than a plant cell, which makes it also easily digestible for us. Uh, and of course, uh, with the full meat market that's out there now, nowadays, um, you know, plant-based meats and all of those, you know, algae being able to produce this protein far more efficiently uh, can have far less impact on the environment and still uh, make it to where uh, protein is readily available for people. Uh, and so when we think about all of these kinds of efforts, there's lots that we can do. Um, but it's still as challenging as to how to implement that, you know, because it does rely on industry, but industry is also based on consumers and consumers can, you know, make 
an impact uh, based on that. But we all have to really think that, you know, saving our rivers and oceans, it's really up to us. You know, it's us as the consumers, it's us as conservationists, it's us as citizen scientists uh, and people who work at these facilities, we can impact and influence them. So the question is really, what are we gonna do about it, right? Well, this is a start. You know, awareness is only ever the first step. You know, awareness just brings the education to you, but it's what you do with that education. You need to be inspired to actually take action steps. Uh, and when we do that, significant change can happen. We see that happening in our country right now uh, with a lot of things like protests going on, uh, but that's trying to take action. Right, a lot more than just sitting back and, and reading about it, and you know, hitting sad faces on posts on Facebook or something like that. You know, those that's great, but awareness isn't enough. We have to be able to take action. Uh, and so, if any of you are interested in learning more about that, uh, you can reach out to me. There's my contact information there, my phone number, and my email address. Um, and uh, we can work together to hopefully solve some of the issues that are facing this planet at this time. So I'm going to stop talking and um, check on things like our, uh, our chat and see if there are any questions because, of course, uh, you can pose those in the chat or the Q&A and uh, yep. let's see. Thanks so much, Joel. That was a really interesting example of how our local actions can have a global impact. And um, like Joel mentioned, if you have any questions right now for him, feel free to type them either in the chat box or the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. And we'll wait a few seconds to see if we get anything. Um, Colleen doesn't have a question, but she said this is very interesting. Thank you. So while we're considering that, I'll just tell you a little bit more about what's going on over here at the zoo. Um, you know, this, the sad thing about COVID is uh, certainly it's closed down a lot of businesses. You know, we were closed here at the zoo uh, right up until June 26th, and then we were only able to open uh, unlimited capacity, 25% uh, capacity, um, which of course has resulted in, you know, huge income drop for the zoo. And the reason that's important is that we fund our conservation projects through admission here at the zoo. Uh, typically, 25 cents of every admission ticket goes to our conservation programs. Uh, this year, we had to suspend that simply because we barely have enough money to keep you know, our animals fed and our staff paid. Uh, and so you know, that, that was a real hit, not just here at Niobe, but at every zoo across the world, this has happened. Um, and so if it's happening to us, and we are one of the largest money drivers for conservation, then you can also understand that it's impacting conservation organizations in the field pretty dramatically. And so, you know, Chihuahua Wheel, it's the same sort of thing. They don't have as much money coming in, uh, so their research has to go down because if you can't buy fuel for your boat, you know, that's the big, one of the biggest expenses is boat maintenance. Um, but if you can't get out there to actually see them, then there's not much studying that you can do if you can't get there. Um, and so, you know, that's, that's a sad thing that's happening right now. Um, and we're trying to come up with alternative ways to still support conservation. Um, we hope that uh, in the fall here, that we'll actually try to reestablish our conservation and science speaker series uh, through a Zoom platform in which, you know, we'll try to do some online fundraisers uh, for our conservation partners, um, since it is not coming in the same old way that it has in the past. Okay, thanks, Joel. Um, looks like, um, well, Colleen is wondering if you're going to be having any more presentations um, uh, anywhere in the near future. Do you have anything coming up? Uh, well, uh, of course, I mentioned, you know, the potential ones happening in the fall, um, but we don't have any set dates for those. Um, now, I know that uh, we do have the Bi-State Conservation Action Network, uh, which is uh, a collaborative uh, between a number of conservation groups, you know, throughout the Quad Cities. And we're actually going to be doing a, uh, a lunch presentation uh, on the 24th. Um, so that's what, next next week on Thursday. Uh, and that's going to start at 1130 over at uh, the Illiniwek Forest Preserve. So it's actually going to be both live and on Zoom. Uh, so if people want to take their lunch and come out to Illiniwek and, um, you know, see 
a presentation where we're actually discussing this issue of conservation challenges during the time of COVID. Um, and so we'll be having a, a discussion there that I'll be facilitating. Uh, and then we're going to actually go on a little nature hike into the forest preserve uh, to see how Alinawek has uh, reestablished a number uh, of, uh, of prairie areas there. Uh, with native grasses and pollinator friendly plants, um, which has had a huge, huge boost um, to some of their conservation work, including uh, developing a site that is uh, good for the endangered rusty patch bumblebee, uh, which they were able to identify this year over there. So that, that's a pretty exciting thing uh, for one of our fellow forest preserves, because here at the Niobe Zoo, we're also one of the Rock Island County forest preserves. Uh, and so, so that'll be exciting over there. Uh, but that'll be, like I say, both live and on Zoom. Um, and if anyone is interested, you've got my email right there. Shoot me a message and I will send the flyer to you and it'll have the registration uh, for both Zoom or for the live. All right, great. Um, it doesn't look like we have any more questions for Joel, but I want to thank everyone for attending today. And I want to thank Joel for a great presentation as well as Brian from ATEC for helping us set up the Zoom. Um, we hope to see you all on October 20th for our October forum. It's going to be on um, the Iowa DNR talking about Iowa's fish tissue monitoring program. So it should be another interesting one. So thank you all and we hope to see you all either in Zoom or in person soon. Thanks. Take care everyone.